Uh, Ephesians 5, 1 to 5. Therefore, be imitators of God as dearly loved children and walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. But sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you as is proper for the saints. And coarse and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks. For no one recognised this, no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of the Messiah and of God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Uh, there's an outline in the inside of the newsletter on the left-hand side. Uh, God willing, there'll be an opportunity to ask some brief questions at the end. Please keep your Bibles open or uh, the A4 sheets there. But I want to start with family. Uh, family is a bit of a theme in Ephesians. And I want to start with my younger sister, Martha. Uh, Martha was going on beach mission one year. Hands up here if you know what I say, when I say beach mission. So it's a whole bunch of people uh, go to a coastal caravan park in the period after Christmas and spent about two weeks running a program to introduce people to Jesus. Uh, Martha was very excited. Uh, she was going down to Jeringong, which was just south of where Martha and I grew up in Kiama. Uh, every morning, uh, if you're familiar with what happens in those missions, uh, the team gets ready, some of them put on outfits and juggle, and they walk around the caravan park and invite families and kids to come to the sessions. Uh, Martha had never done that before. Uh, it's the first beach mission, so... She asked us to pray and we did and she prayed and then when her courage had been summers with the rest of the team all around her, she headed out to knock on the doors and invite people. Uh, at the first caravan she knocked, the door swung open. Before Martha could say a word, the woman pointed at her and said, you must be Marion Austin's daughter. Uh, Martha was mortified. Uh, mortified that she looked like a mother, whether that's a good or a bad thing, but mortified that this woman knew her though she'd never laid eyes on this woman before. It turned out that this lady had gone to school with our mother. And as soon as Martha opened the door, her family likeness was so striking that this woman said, you're Marion Austin's daughter. Oh, we know about family likeness, don't we? Some of the family likeness that is passed on is non-negotiable. It's just physical, isn't it? Other family likeness that is passed on covers everything from the words you use, the way you do dinner, how you celebrate birthdays, all those kinds of things. But all of us walk in our family likeness. All of us walk in our family likeness and God's family is no different. God's family are to walk in the family likeness. To be in God's family is to bear the family likeness. To be in God's family is to walk in the key attribute which is love. To walk in God's family is to walk in the right love, not the wrong love. Because to walk in the wrong love takes you out of the family, doesn't it? And we're going to look at that now. Let me pray. Dear God, I've been reminded uh, of my sin as I handle the word of God. We gathered together today as saved sinners. Father, thank you for your forgiveness. Thank you for your adoption. Thank you for your work in us to restore the image of our creator, our Father, as we look at these words, which are really quite simple, please apply them to our hearts, minds, hands, feet, tongues, to our whole walk so people look at us as a community and individuals and says that is the family of God and are prompted to ask about his love. In Jesus' name, amen. At point two on the outline, look there in verse one. <clears throat> Therefore be imitators of God as dearly loved children, and walk in love, as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us, a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. Remember last week I, I talked about the importance of words, and remember I said Paul doesn't waste his words. You, like I said, you, you can't afford to waste words when you're in jail. And he starts this section with the same word, doesn't he? Therefore. Uh, and this time again he wants us to cast our minds back to remember all the stuff that's gone before. And as we do... He wants us to remember that peppered throughout that section are references to the family likeness. I remember that plan of God way back in chapter 1, verses 3 to 14. You'll see there that God wanted to create a people for himself, gathered together through Jesus. And you'll notice when you look back at that, that love's mentioned a number of times. 
Humans by nature don't want a borrower. They do that. They have sin in their hearts and minds, the attitude and action that says, I'm God and God's not. They love themselves instead of God. And so that brings them under the right judgment of God. So no, no one can dwell face to face with God. God steps in and you remember in Ephesians 2 verse 4, because of his great love, mercy, grace, he sends his one and only son to take all that judgment upon himself because he lived the life we couldn't live. He loved God. And simply by trusting in what Jesus has done, taking God at his word, trusting that Jesus has done that for you, God signs adoption papers and says, you're in my mob. You're mine. And when that happens, God remakes the person so they bear the family light. We've looked at that as a community. That's what Phil looked at. We've looked at that as we try and understand the temptation to go back to the old walk. Remember that from last week? And this week we're looking at the family lights. And I want us to really grasp, even though many of the translations don't pick it up, the key word for Ephesians is household. Household. It's there so often. And we are brought into God's household, which is why this is so important because we're sharing a meal as a household, aren't we? A symbolic meal. That all together we are equal in sin and salvation because God loves us. Now, Paul's written all that down. That's his identity. We, we've seen that. That's our identity. That's the identity of the mob in Ephesus. Now, we're thinking about what that looks like. Remember that idea of walking? That's right throughout this second part of the book. You've got to imitate your father. And it means you've got to display the family likeness. One of the moments that was brought back to me, I've just asked his permission to share this story, is a moment when Seth was about six months old. We were living at Moore College in Newtown and every year at Moore College we, we had a heritage round. We met as a college to do 1662, even if you weren't an Anglican. And uh, we lived in a, a little street and I, I loved the newspapers, uh, not the virtue, you've got to have the ink on your hands. And so each morning I'd walk up, get to the traffic lights, wait to cross King Street, Newtown, go and buy the papers and come back. Well, one morning I took Seth up with me, six months, got to the lights, pressed the button, beep, 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 beep went for my wallet, and then I uttered that Toyota word. And I uh, thought I'd better go back to my family and grab my wallet. And so I did, and we walked back up, they pressed the button, and what did that little boy in my arms mutter? The Toyota word. You see, he bore the family likeness. He was like me, exactly like me. And children are like that. Whether it's their father or their mother, they will bear the family resemblance because it is imprinted on them. We're in a family, aren't we? We're in God's family. We're in a household. Did we think about that this morning? I'm going to go and hang out with the household. It's my family. I'm going to have a meal with my household. In fact, isn't it wonderful to have a meal with your household that goes across the generations back to 1662? And others will be meeting likewise. Now, we don't want that by nature as humans, do we? We want to create our own household. A household that looks like me, not God, because I know better than God. And so God, through Jesus dealing with our rebellion, adopts corpses, makes them alive and puts them in his mob. He restores them. And that means they've got to walk like him and all of that is because God loved us, lavished his love, Beyond our comprehension, in fact, if you want to talk about the family likeness of God's family, what is it? It's love. You know how families have reputations? My birth family has a reputation for talking a lot. That's why my nickname at points was Gabala. <laughs> We're a family that's argumentative. We like to have debates and we just talk across each other. Some families are renowned for their generosity, aren't they? Some are renowned for their ability to cultivate spiderwebs and coins. Some family are known for being sporty. Some families for not being sporty. God's family is known for love. Ephesians 2 verse 4. It was because of God's great love. 
That's our DNA. That's the strand. That's the thing that ties us together, which defines us, which is our walk. But it does raise a question, what kind of love is he talking about? I, I love donuts. I love running. I love Parramatta. I love my family. Which, which love? So that's the problem with our language, isn't it? He tells us which love, doesn't he? Look there in verse 2. And walk in love as the Messiah also loved us and gave himself for us a sacrificial and fragrant offering to God. This love fits God's design and plan. That's why the word Messiah is there because that's God's historical plan that he's going to do something about the way in which humans have rebelled and broken the world. And it's connected with a bloke called Jesus. That love is sacrificial, isn't it? Gave himself for us. What were we when he gave himself for us? We were enemies. We were corpses. We were rebels. That's love that serves, that is gracious, that doles out to people who hate God what they do not deserve. That love is serving. That love is so pleasing to God that it is fragrant. Can you, have you ever heard the cross described as fragrant? I mean, that really bloody, historical, smelly, dirty, grimy event is fragrant. Is fragrant because it pays for the sin of God's people. That's right, love, isn't it? That's the love that defines the family of God. That's the love that's made the family of God. That's the love that God as Father displays for rebels. So walk like your father. Now, I, I, I can't mind read the Ephesians. It's always good to read between the lines. But I suspect it caused them to stop and think. If I knocked on a door of someone who didn't know me personally, could they look at my life and go, you're God's child, like my sister had with Marion Austin? Could people look at us as a community in Narrabri? a community within a community? Could people look at us as individuals who walk within this community and go, I, I know what you guys look like. You, you guys look like God because you love sacrificially, graciously, doling out what isn't deserved, serving in a way that is fragrant to God. But sexual immorality and any impurity or greed should not even be heard of among you as is proper for saints. And coarse and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable but rather giving thanks. You see, there's a wrong love, isn't there? There's a wrong love. A wrong love that isn't defined by walking in God's likeness but is walking in my likeness, your likeness, our likeness. The likeness is people who want to be God instead of God. And Paul identifies that very clearly there, doesn't he, in verse 3. Sexual immorality, impurity or greed. It basically, it boils down to those two on either end and impurity is a catch-all phrase in the middle that covers them. They're, they're wrong loves, aren't they? Sexual immorality takes what God has designed to express the love between a husband and wife entered into permanently as a binding agreement to reflect God and his people, it takes that and uses it to satisfy self. Anyway, anytime, anyhow. Greed? Well, greed is giving devotion that God deserves to something else that I decide. That's what greed is. That's why it's called idolatry because it gives something else what God deserves. Both of them are wrong loves, aren't they? Because at the heart of both of them is not God's design, but my design. At the heart of both of them is not sacrifice, but taking. At the heart of both of them is not grace and service, but satisfaction of my lust. Instead of pleasing God, it's a stench to God. It's offensive to God. It says, I run this household. And to walk like that is to walk in wrong love. It's to bear the wrong family likeness, isn't it? 
And it is so important on many levels. But did you notice the level Paul picks up in verse 3? It's highlighted there. Should not even be heard of. You see, we walk in a bigger community, don't we? And they watch us. They hear about us. And it should not be heard of that we walk in the wrong love. Now, let me be clear at this point. He's not talking about our battle against sin because we'll all battle against sin until we know fully in heaven. He's talking about bathing in the wrong walk, the wrong love, the habitual, remember habit from last week? The habitual lifestyle that says verbally, I'm in God's family, but really I run my own family. And he is very focused, Paul, here in saying, do not let be heard of among you that you walk in the wrong love. Not only just walk in it, but talk about it. Did you see how he moves from action to conversation, three to four? Coarse and foolish talking or crude joking are not suitable, but rather giving thanks. A coarse language, it just takes God's design and roughs it up, uses it wrongly. Foolish language actually doesn't consider the seriousness of the right and the wrong love. Crude language, it just uses God's design and makes it the butt of a joke. They're all wrong love, aren't they? And it's not fitting for God's family. In fact, how should God's family talk? Giving thanks. And that's the heart of love. It's profoundly other persons. You, you can't give thanks without directing it to someone, can you? Directing thanks to yourself is not really giving thanks, is it? And so when God's people give thanks, they express the other person's centeredness of the family likeness, which is love. They show their dependence on the one who's made them. God's people do not walk in the wrong love. Again, remember, he's not talking about our battle against sin. He'll de he's dealt with that right throughout. He's talking about saying you're a member of this family but habitually bathing and walking in the wrong love. That's not how God's family works. We walk reflecting our Father because the consequences are large, aren't they? One of the worst things that can happen to any person is to be excluded from their family, to be cast out, to no longer be welcome, to have no inheritance. Verse 5, for no one recognise this, no sexually immoral or impure or greedy person who is an idolater has an inheritance in the kingdom of the Messiah and of God. If you walk in the wrong love, you have no inheritance. If you walk in the wrong love, you have no inheritance. God takes the conduct of his family very seriously, doesn't he? God's love is not cheap. God has adopted us at great expense, the sacrifice of his son. The seriousness of wrong love is not to be underestimated. To claim membership in God's family is to live as imitators of the Father and to walk in love. But there is hope, isn't there? Did you notice the hope contained there in verse Five, it's that little word at the start of the last sentence, the last line, has. That's present tense, isn't it? There is always time to come back to God. Isn't it remarkable how a little word, just the present tense, can open up a gate of glory? This is not a pronouncement that they will never inherit it's a statement and a warning that says, come back. God loves those made in his image. He sent Jesus to live, die and rise. There is hope if you walk in the wrong love to be adopted into God's family by everything God has done. Come back. Come back. 
come out of darkness and futility like we heard last week and come into life as God has designed it. Now, really, it's not a complicated passage, is it? The truth of living in God's family is very simple. I'm at the last point. If you are in God's family by being connected to Jesus and what he has already done for you by trusting in him, God is your father and we must walk in the family likeness, walk in right love. To walk in wrong love is to walk outside the family and to have no inheritance. Please come back. Please come back. So what does that look like? Well, let me offer three closing ideas about how we might put this into practice. We've all got role models. We've all got heroes that we desire to be like, that we model ourselves on. Some might be in our own family, some might be outside our family. In God's family, who's the role model? It's the father, isn't it? Walk like your father. Walk like your father. To do that, we've got to know our father, don't we? And the best way to know your father is to listen to him. And the best way to listen to him is to read the Bible. That's the father. The word of God is the revelation of God. Who he is, his character, his nature, his love. The way in which his love is so wonderful, offering forgiveness, but also standing against sin. The way in which his plan has always been to adopt people into his family in a way that we struggle to comprehend. So if we're going to walk like him, we've got to know him. And we know him by reading his word. Secondly, there is seriousness here, isn't there? Do not, yeah, I stumbled over that word, didn't I? I was trying. Do not take the walk in the wrong love wrong as, as your way of life. In our diocese, in the world circle of Christians in the last decade, we have lost significant leaders, haven't we? Why? Because they walked in the wrong life. They habitually walked in their own image. This is serious. This is serious. Have nothing to do with wrong love. Nothing to do with them. Finally, where do we start in cultivating this right love? Well, we word of God. But let me tell you that in the household of God, as we're going to find out over the next few weeks, the best place to start is in our own households, isn't it? And so there is advice here for parents and grandparents, for siblings. How do we help our children, grandchildren and family imitate God? Well, by introducing them to God, by showing them what God's love is like. How do we do that? By reading the Bible, by actually walking like our Father, by actually being people who take these things seriously, who walk in the right love and that shows in our priorities, in what we do with our Sunday mornings. In what we do with the greetings we write on birthday cards. In what we do in terms of our conversations. It starts in our households, doesn't it? It's not a responsibility to be outsourced. But it's a right walk to exercise within our own homes. To walk in the family likeness. Let me pray. Dear God, thank you for your word. Thank you for the great goodness of your love. Father, this passage is really nothing without that. A reminder that you loved us in a way we didn't deserve, bringing us into a family that we had turned against, adopting us at great expense and granting that goodness of being your children by the life, death and resurrection of your son. Father, please help us to walk in the family likeness, in the right love. Please guard us against the habits of wrong love and please enable us in our own households to be people who proclaim the right love in what we do, say and think. In Jesus' name, amen.